Hello, and welcome to our service today, the 25th of October. Today's service is being delivered by our Monday evening discussion group. Different members of our group will be leading the YouTube version, and others will lead the service in chapel, dependent on what they feel comfortable in doing. Our service today is focused on one word, doubt. Now, as Christians, we're different from other religions. They have books of rules and regulations that they have to follow. We, though, have the example of Christ's life as our primary guide. This means that we have to think, to analyse, to understand and interpret what we are and what we should believe. Now, Part of this deeper understanding sometimes includes doubt, which is natural, but not always easy. I've got a lot of sympathy for Thomas, the great doubter, who refused to believe Jesus was resurrected until he saw and felt the actual wounds. Jesus' reply to Thomas was, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We are those people. We weren't there. We did not see in person. But we are blessed because we believe. Let us sing the hymn, Rejoice, Rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you, arise, a mighty army, we arise. Now is the time for us to march upon the land into our hands. Rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of glory in our hearts. He lives, he lives, his breath is in you, arise, a mighty army, we arise. Let us say thank you to God for his blessings, especially in these difficult times. Dear Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your creation all around us. 
beauty that gives us so much pleasure when other pastimes are not available. We delight in the familiarity of the passings of the seasons, the comfort we find knowing you are unalterable and trustworthy. We see the power of our communities, the support of strangers looking to help each other. We give thanks for families, for the comfort, support and joy for our children and grandchildren. We give thanks for your support when things are dark and difficult, for the quiet voice telling us all will be well, that you are in charge. Amen. And now we have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. You can't do that, can you? Let's take a look at some things we may be doubtful that can actually happen. We've got two examples for you. See this egg? It's too big to fit into the bottle. Or is it? If I try to press it in, I'll squash it. No. I don't think it can be done. Or can it? If I put some hot water in the bottle and then rest the egg on the top, in it goes all in one piece. But can I get it out again? I can, if I blow it out. There. So how does that work? How can we get an egg into the bottle when it's too big to fit through the neck? Now, acting on the egg outside and inside the bottle, we've got air pressure, and they're both the same. When we add the hot water and replace the egg, then as the water cools, the pressure inside reduces, and now the pressure outside is bigger, and it pushes the egg into the bottle. In order to get the egg back out of the bottle, we must try to increase the pressure inside the bottle and that will blow out the egg. Will this metal needle float or sink in water? Well, let's try it and see. it sinks. So, can the needle float on water? No, I don't think it can. Or can it? If I put the needle on a piece of paper and carefully lay it on the surface of the water, it will be held afloat by the paper. But when the paper soaks up the water, it becomes heavier and sinks, leaving the needle floating on the surface. And how does this happen? It's kept afloat by surface tension. The water seems to have a skin on top which can support small objects. You can see the indentation of the water surface by the needle. And you can see it from underneath. There are insects who can walk on this skin. 
This one is a pond skater. It took a lot more than surface tension to keep Jesus and, briefly, Peter walking on water. That took an act of faith in God who can help us to do things that we think are impossible. The reading is from John 11, chapters 1 to 4 and 17 to 44. The death of Lazarus. Now a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of, of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When they heard this, Jesus said, This illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus comforts the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to, come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replies, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come to into this world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she went, got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, which was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforted her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn, her, mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid, your, laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man and have kept this man from dying? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was in a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time this has been a bad odour, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone stone then jesus looked up and said father i thank you that you have heard me i knew that you would always hear me but i said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you are you sent me when he had said this jesus called in a loud voice lazarus come out the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with stri strips of linen and cloth round his face Jesus said to them, take off the grave cloth and let them go. So in this Bible reading, people believe Jesus has come too late to save Lazarus. But yet he proves his power, his authority, by bringing Lazarus back. Imagine if you saw this happen in your family. Would this not get rid of any doubts that you might have? 
Our next hymn is My Lighthouse. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness to show second reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, reading verses 22 to 33. Jesus walks on the sea. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, 
If it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Thanks be to God for this reading of his word. This is actually one of my favourite Bible readings. Peter almost has it. He realises that by faith he can walk on water. He can overcome his fear. But doubt overcomes him. He is of little faith. Now our Monday evening discussion group is still meeting via Zoom. So we looked at the subject of doubt as one of our themes. And we'd like to tell you what we came up with. And then we will look at any conclusions we came up with. The actual points are really quotes of what was said by different individuals in the group. Our home group topic was to discuss three questions. What makes us doubt? What gets rid of doubts? And in the light of these doubts, what has Jesus done for us? The following are our responses. What makes us doubt? The initial response was that doubt is not wrong. We all experience doubt. Life is full of them. Doubt encourages us to think and to make decisions of our own. Of course, the results and the self-reflection is so much easier when combined with prayer. No one is immune. Doubt happens to us all. You've just got to learn how to live and how to handle the doubts as they come along. Doubt seems more significant when we're faced with disasters and suffering at home and throughout the world as we are just now. We ask ourselves, why Lord, why? Where are you? Overanalyzing can be confusing and harmful, especially when praying and the results of prayer don't come swiftly or result just as we thought they should or we would have liked them to be. Doubt can be negative or even crippling, but for the most part, doubt helps us not to be foolish or get us into bad or difficult situations. The second part of our topic was what gets rid of doubts and we, we talked about encouragement and experience from others who have either faced similar situations in the past or are currently going through similar situations and we were using prayer as a guide in those circumstances. Then there was the example set by the disciples. We read in our Bibles the examples given by disciples who doubted until they saw I mean, for example, we can think of doubting Thomas, sceptic, who refused to believe without his direct personal experience. He needed to see and feel the wounds that Jesus had suffered on the cross. Then there's the example of other believers, doubting through visual experience, seeing in other words. In Matthew 28, we read that the disciples went to the hill in Galilee, because they were told that the risen Christ would meet them there. And when they saw Jesus, they truly believed in the risen Christ. And, and our final topic was, final part of our topic was, what has Jesus done for us? And so the first thing we talked about was Jesus proving himself when we ask. There was doubting Peter as Jesus let him walk on water. Jesus gives Peter the means to trust him. And he did walk on water. When we're totally honest with God about our doubts, 
asking through prayer does, does help us grow. We also talked about Jesus trusting us to live for ourselves while showing us how to live in unknown and uncertain situations right now. And helps us to overcome doubts by, by directing our lives and opening opportunities through giving gentle nudges in the right direction. Helping us to focus on the good in our lives, perhaps, and reflecting on, on our past achievements. And as adults, we, we can easily complicate life. We read, don't we, that we should have faith like a child. Simple, but honest. The other one we discussed was Jesus dying for you and me, so we wouldn't die in him. How can we doubt in Jesus when he shows unto us and others? How to live through love. Amen. So our discussion group came to the conclusion that there are many things happening out in the world that can cause us doubt. But doubt is not a bad thing. It's the fire in which we test our faith and make it stronger. Through prayer, through the example of the disciples, through the support of Jesus, we can face and overcome our doubts and our fears, for he is with us until the end of time. We now come to our prayers for others. Let us pray. Loving Father God, we thank you today for the message of hope that lies at the heart of the Gospel. The assurance that whatever may seem to deny it, your love will emerge victorious. Help us to use this time that you have given us to hear your voice, discern your will and grow closer to you so that we may return to our daily lives renewed by your hope and vision. Help us to be strengthened in our faith and equipped to offer thanksgiving, not just our, with our words, but through everything we are and the actions we take. Spirit of God, your peace is for all, for you're at work in every heart. So today, Lord, we pray for all in our world who hunger for peace and fairness. We pray for those tormented by fear, torn by doubt troubled by anxieties or tortured by guilt. We pray for the homeless, the hungry, the nations ravaged by war. May they find through you love and peace of mind. In faith we lift them before you. Please hear our prayer. Caring God, you have promised that those mourning the loss of a loved one shall be comforted so we pray for all those facing sorrow at this time. Support them with your love through all that they face, sharing their pain and their sorrow. Be their light, Lord. God of love, we pray today for people everywhere who are sick and suffering in any way. In a moment of quietness, we offer up to you those people known to us. We thank you today for all who work in our essential services and in particular those who work in the NHS, social care services and other caring roles. We value the skills, compassion and dedication we depend on so much. Please support and encourage them to maintain their care for us and to show your love through their ministry. Finally, Lord, we pray for one another in our relationships with family and friends at work and leisure and in our relationship with you. Help us to always acknowledge the mercy and love you so freely offer and always to show love and mercy in return. We ask all these prayers in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn today is great is thy faithfulness. I invite you to either listen to the words or sing along at home.
Remember, the Lord is always with you. Here is the poem, Footprints in the Sand, written by Carolyn Joyce Carty. One night, a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand, he noticed that many times along the path of his life there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, There is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you most you would leave me. The Lord replied. My son, my precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering when you only saw one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. So let us finish by saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I wonder what's behind this door with the wreath.
In 2014, David Katoto won Kiribati's first gold medal at a major sporting event in weightlifting. He drew the world's attention with his joyous dancing both in victory and defeat. And because of this, the world's media turned its attention on Kiribati and its climate crisis. David ended up becoming an accidental environmental activist. And the project total to date is £633.